Hi there, come on in. What do you do when you're fishing a northern lake, one with rocks around the shore? It's a very windy day and you're fishing for pike and walleye. Do you stay in the wind where it's less comfortable or do you hide behind the islands and stay close to shore where you're out of the wind? Well, I used to stay out of the wind until Mark Martin showed me where the pike and walleye hang out on windy days. Believe it or not, those wind and wave beaten shorelines, if they have the right structure, are where these fish can be found in close. A little later, we'll warm up with a recipe for venison barley soup and more. So you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. A nice fish right there. They're good and healthy fish, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And by the financial support of viewers like you, This is the kind of morning you like to wake up to when you're fishing a northern lake in the summer. Mark Martin is a walleye fishing pro. Literally, in 1990, he won the World Walleye Championship. Last July, we fished with him at Gunaseo Lake in northern Manitoba, a lake that's full of big walleye. But the guides didn't know where the big ones went after the end of June. Now Mark found him on his flasher by locating sunken islands that were 15 or 16 feet down with deep water all around these sunken plateaus. That's where we caught walleye all day long when the weather was good. Back trolling was the main technique, but the second morning we got up to a blustery wind, and that's when Mark said we could catch fish within a few hundred yards of the lodge. Uh, we have a rocky shoreline where the waves are coming in and beating on the shoreline, which uh, picks up little uh, particles and uh, microorganisms, and that what in turn gets the minnows to come in here. But when the minnows come in, they get pretty disorientated about a lot of things as far as they're swimming, and, and they're easy prey for the predator fish that are around here. And like the rock here behind us is flat rock, isn't as nearly as productive as the bolt, small boulders on each side. And especially this point right here with the, you have small boulders on is gonna be more productive, say, than that point over there that has a smooth rock point, unless there's some broken rocks down there. So yeah. you mean that's because the minnows get washed up in around those rocks, it's more turbulent? Yeah, you have more turbulence and, and you have more places for the minnows to hide around those small rocks. They have more habitat than, say, a flat, smooth surface where there's nothing for them to hide behind. The, and, you know, it keep, there's more turbulent where there's smooth surfaces than... So uh, how, how close to those rocks do you fish? Right, right on, on them. Right on, right on them. them. You know, the, uh, right now, uh, you're going to be, you know, casting in within, oh, you know, you hit the rocks even, you know, if you want to. But uh, any place within three to five feet of them, uh, you'll be able to take fish off of them. In most cases, they'll be somewhere right in that area. When Mark pulled within casting distance to the shore, I made one cast, and that's all it took. I got one. I cannot, I cannot believe this, Mark. My first cast up, up against the rocks. I, I, I figured this, one of us would get I, one right in oh, here. Oh, he just uh, got off. He got on it. I can't believe that. Well, I'm going to take <laughs> See one that more point pop right there, a point of those rocks right there. That's, that's a good little feeding station right there. The wind and the rocks were the key. A fairly steep drop off into six or eight feet of water. It was amazing how close the fish were to the rocks. They'd strike within a few feet from shore. Well, you could troll, you could troll but casting, uh, you could cover each specific rock because sometimes It'll be maybe just one rock on this whole shoreline or two rocks that are really productive uh, as opposed to the, say, the whole shoreline. You're not going to have, uh, they're not they're, no, they're not going to be stacked up to all, all along here. There's going to be a certain, certain rocks and certain features down here that we're going to find out about and where these fish are. Uh, and then they're always going to be there. You can come back an hour from now, and maybe catch another one. You can come back a week from now and catch another one. You know, there, it's always going to be a spot where you can catch a fish. But you're not talking. If it was calm right now, it when the water was flat. Yeah. It wouldn't work. No, it wouldn't be as as good. No. Walleye. Oh. Hey, there. I, there's walleye up here. <laughs> 
This rocky shoreline was the last place we fished the night before. We tried many lures, but caught nothing. The owner, Jim Budd, said that few people ever fished this close to the boat dock, and fewer people caught anything when they did. Yeah, the, this, uh, this is going to be some uh, good fishing for this lake right here. There's Fred's got one now. Yep. Oh, this is uncanny. I, I can't even believe this, Mark. Amazing, isn't it? It is. <laughs> I mean, I would have never stopped to fish this on a day like this. You got a walleye there too, don't you, yeah, Fred? I see, see, the walleyes will inhabit maybe a little different area than the northerns, and they won't they won't intermix either very often. There we go. And with this barbless hook, comes right out. This windy shoreline fishing isn't a trophy walleye technique, but you can catch eaters on lures like an Erie Deary and Nightcrawler, a jig with a twister tail, they work well off the rocks. We also caught them on big lipped crankbaits that dive deep. The key is having a windy day, a rocky shoreline that has small boulders and creates a lot of pockets and splash from the wind, anchor or drift offshore and cast right into those rocks. It amazed me but it's one way to catch walleye in the wind. There are many different patterns and lessons we can learn about fishing or hunting, and weather conditions are one that are important to key in on, and the success of fishing different weather conditions depends, though, on the species of fish you're going after. Their habits are different. It varies with the time of year, too. Just because a technique works one month, it doesn't mean it'll work in another. Fish aren't always in that part of the lake due to water temperature or maybe spawning behavior. Also, the types of food that fish eat can change from month to month depending on what's available. So your baits or lures have to change to match it. If you find particularly good success for a certain species at a certain time of year, under certain weather conditions, in a certain place with a certain bait, duplicate those the following year in all likelihood they'll work again. But if you're off on the patterns, it might not work at all. For example, let's take a look at this chart that we put together, a computer analysis of trophy-sized carp taken on hook and line uh, and bull fishing. You can see the month of May is the peak. Year after year, late April, entire month of May, and early June see more 30-pound-plus carp taken than all the other months combined. That's when an angler is most likely to catch one for our trophy book. <laughs> Great picture of a happy angler with a trophy carp. Ron St. Germain from Lansing caught this 35-inch carp fishing from a walkway along the Grand River in downtown Lansing. The date was May 7th. That's a prime month for catching big carp. Charlie Fisher from Kentwood asked that we don't publicize where he caught this 22-inch largemouth bass, but it was Memorial Day weekend in 1991. He was casting a Gitsit tube lure, and it was in Nuego County. Here's a 22-inch smallmouth bass that Gary Lutzo from Rogers City caught from Lake Nettie in Presquillo County. Gary was casting a jitterbug June 1st, just before noon. You've heard my guide reports from the Keweenaw Peninsula on pike fishing. Well, here's a 44-inch northern pike from Portage Lake up there, a Memorial Weekend catch. Kevin Curtin from Green Bay, Wisconsin caught it still fishing a dead smelt. Now this looks like a big lake trout from the Canadian wilderness, but it's another Keweenaw County catch from Lake Superior, end of June. Mike Shivo from Crystal Falls caught this 42-incher on a bomber. That's a great picture. Here's a nice crappie caught by Dave Sanders from Saginaw. He was fishing Sand Lake, Iosco County, the end of May, using a traditional crappie bait, a minnow. Now Joshua Jarvis Davis from Ann Arbor caught a trophy crappie too from a pond in Washtenaw County, but Josh wasn't using such a traditional bait. I would use roast beef and my dad put a big cook on it and put some roast beef on it and... Roast beef, are you following this? <laughs> roast beef, who told you to use roast beef? My dad. You told him to use roast beef? We ran out of bait. Oh. Yeah, we ran out of bait and we had two roast beef sandwiches and so we used the roast beef. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, ran out of bait, so you must have been catching a lot of them, huh? Yes. Well, that's great, and you caught a black crappie. 
that was two pounds, 14 and a half inches. Sharing a sandwich with a trophy fish? That's a nice gesture and a good tip that makes Joshua Jarvis Davis our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Crappie Angler of the Week. They also receive free entry to the Michigan Outdoors TV Museum, where this Saturday our sensitive float fishing specialist, Craig Scoff, will be on hand all day to answer questions. He also has his specialized tackle available. I'll be sitting on the gangplank for the dunk tank. They'll have a variety of novelty shoots and silhouette courses. The on Thursday, April 30th, we ran part three of our sensitive float fishing series, but on that evening, three public television stations were holding their auctions. The weekend repeat, uh, two stations ran the wrong show, and we had people who wanted to see the third part of that series. So if you've already seen it, I apologize. If you haven't seen it, now's your lucky moment. Part three of sensitive float fishing. Looks like a Pac-Man. Waka, 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 waka. <laughs> it does, but it's called a plummet. This is something that was used in Europe. As I haven't seen them in the United States yet until right now. But this is used by anglers who want to set the depth for float fishing, which you can do with jigs and live bait, all kinds of things. But this, this plummet, this is really cool. You can take it, for example, you're using a teardrop or a hook underneath a float. You can clip the whole thing on that plummet and drop it in the water to find your depth. You take it down to the bottom and then lift it up a little bit so you identify the depth you want. Take the plummet, squeeze it, take your bait off or your lure, and you have the depth to set your bobber. One of the accessories that Craig Scoff introduced me to is Float Fishing Specialty Shop. Here's another one. This is also called a plummet? Yes, this would be if you were using uh, the tiny hooks. You won't damage the barb if you put it in the cork in the bottom. So you take, take the barb, put it in the cork, Yep, you'd run your hook through the top of that eye first so you mm -hmm. wouldn't, it wouldn't come off and then you'd stick it in the bottom. Stick it down to the bottom, bring it back up once you set your depth and then just take the hook out. Different kind of plummet than mm -hmm. we're used to. We're used to the alligator well, clip so type. many of those damage your line and damage your hooks mm -hmm. that you want something that isn't going to do that. These accessories for this sensitive float fishing, you see how, how thin the line is? One or two pound test line. We have floats, not bobbers, important, important to Craig at least, and hey, you know, a bobber is something that we consider to be like this type here, called a Dayton float, but it's a bobber, it bobs in the water. These do much more than bob in the water. They actually, for example, Craig, as this is balanced, when a fish comes, and oftentimes they might take it from beneath and lift up. Exactly, the float will follow that shot no matter where it goes. If it goes sideways, it'll follow it. If it goes down, it goes up. A fish can't move that a quarter inch without you in, knowing it. In fact, I bet you we can show that right here in the tank mm -hmm. with this teardrop. I'll drop it in the water and, and see how that balances. Ice fishermen can use this, and very frankly, we have a lot of trophy fish caught in the summer. But if you move this teardrop and lift it up, look at what happens to the float. The float lifts up. That, if you're fishing with one of these in the summer and you see your float lift, you know that a fish grabbed the, the bait, if you're using a larva or a maggot, lifted it up and you set the hook because you have a fish down there with that bait and that hook in its mouth. Let's just talk one second here before we get into the accessories, Craig, about the virtues of these small hooks. Now, talking about accessories, they have these snelled already exactly. on Exactly, they're a... all pre-snelled. I wouldn't want to have to tie that knot. Okay, let's take one of these out here while we'll just leave it in the package. But looking, looking at the snells, the advantage of a hook this small is a fish will suck it in, exactly. right, with you that little larva. You won't feel that weight, okay? We'll only use teardrops if fish are aggressive, but most of the time they're neutral or negative. So we'll go to a small hook, they'll suck that in, they won't feel the weight of that, they'll mouth the bait and you'll have more time to set that hook. However, you take no time at all because no time as at all. soon as they suck it in, the float moves, mm -hmm. you set the hook and catch them where most of the right time? Right in the upper lip. In the upper lip. Yep. Now, now think about this, folks. When, when your lure or bait is hanging under the water and a fish sucks it in, it takes it in its mouth this direction. And say it sucks it in an inch or two, when you pull it, that line has to go around the corner, out the fish's mouth, and catches it on the upper lip. And I can vouch for this, Craig. 
95% of the time. I, I don't even recall if I've ever caught a fish on the lower lip. I don't think it's possible. No, no, you'll get, always get them in the upper lip generally. Always in or the, the upper side lip. of the mouth if they happen to be swimming away at the side. And people will think, but that hook isn't big enough. You know, you need a big hook to catch a big fish. Well, so many people will use the one pound line, but they won't use the hook to match. You need a small hook. hook a small hook will hook through the skin. A big hook, you have to go through bone and you're, you're hurting the fish, plus you're not aiding in catching and releasing them if it's a smaller fish. And, and these little teeny hooks caught in the lip, you can fight them, pull them in, oh, yeah. take that hook mm -hmm. out, and the hook doesn't work loose. I've caught bass by accident on these when I'm fishing for bluegill, you know, four or five pound bass, and you know, over a period of time, I'm able to land them, and it's just hooked through the lip of skin mm -hmm. there. And it's marvelous because they don't work loose like a larger hook. But let's look at some of the things you have here. Of course, here are Here's the, the split shot. Most people, if they have a small split shot, they would say it's something like, like this here. Whoa, got a few of them out. That is a small split <laughs> shot to most people, right? That's pretty large by our standards, but yeah. for most people, that would be small. For most people, that's small. Let's crank over here. What size, this is number eight? That's number eight. Now, does this correspond with number eight shot? Yes, that, that's an, exactly a number eight shot, bird shot that is split. For you shotgun shooters, yeah. look, look at how small that is. The advantage of small shot is the same as a small hook. It sinks slower. Mm -hmm. Okay, when, you're, when you present your bait to your fish, you need it to come in very slow. If I drop a larva in that water, it's going to sink very, very slowly. And if you have a heavy hook or a heavy shot above that, it'll take it in much quicker and it's going to spook the fish. That's why some of these, uh, these small little floats have a very small weight on them. Exactly. And it balances it and it works and you can detect the fish underneath. Let's see, let, let's, let's go to one, one last device here. Those of you, and I'm interested <laughs> in this too, the fish aren't biting, you know that they're down there somewhere but they might not be near you. Okay, you, you now. You need to chum them in. Chumming, chumming is often done by throwing corn in the water, throwing worms, anything to, to attract the fish into feed. Yeah, you know, I try to keep people away from corn because the fish don't always digest it and they can mm -hmm. kill them, but the maggots are wonderful for chumming. What I do is I take this. Now what is this thing called? This is called a swim feeder. That's a, a European feeder. name. This is my little maggot chummer, you might want to call it. Just put these little larvae in there. Now this is something that the Europeans This developed. is something the Europeans develop. If you want to fish a river or you want to fish deep water for bluegill, let's say you're fishing 30 foot of water and your bluegill are down there, if you chum at 30 foot, they'll, uh, you'll have a problem with um, them spreading out too much. Mm -hmm. But if you sink this down in your rod and put it down at 20 foot, it'll chum a tighter area. Okay, this, we'll just drop this yeah. on the bottom, right? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna drop this on the bottom. This is a little chum. Oh, look at that. The larva see how the larva can just crawl right out? So they crawl out, release themselves at that depth. Exactly. Attract the fish. If you're a trout fisherman, you want to chum these, you cast that out on another rod above the hole, it mm -hmm. chums the hole for you, just like a hatch, an actual hatch. Look at that. They work themselves loose, get out through the holes, and attract the fish. And then we hit them with a barrage of small hooks, <laughs> little maggots, and all types of floats to tell you what's happening. Craig, this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm sure there's many other tips we're going to gather from mm -hmm. you because we want to go out and try this on walleye. It's it's what we used to call the European style fishing, now we call it sensitive, sensitive float. float fishing. Something that will become a big part of American fishing. And most definitely. Most definitely, and in a good share in this state, do exactly. you? Exactly, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you, Craig. This week's recipe for venison garden patch barley soup has a lot of ingredients. <laughs> garden patch barley soup, <laughs> Yes, huh? but um, it's got onion soup mix, crushed red pepper, parsley flakes, celery seed, salt, dry barley, and then uh, you're going to add water to this. And this is going to be your stock. This well, any, any time that Abby lists these things <laughs> on the screen when she's editing this recipe together, we know that there's going to be a lot of ingredients. Exactly. And then you're going to have your veggies. you got um, potatoes and rutabagas. And I didn't really think that there's a whole lot of difference in these, but apparently there is. I don't celery think there is. <laughs> and celery and carrots and uh, just canned tomatoes. Hmm. And then some green onion. And then we're going to have Brussels sprouts. And everybody's going to say, oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you really need a big pot for this. And then the meat is just venison burger and um, cornmeal, white cornmeal. There's no eggs or anything that hold this together. Well, it, as I recall, this is going to be, uh, they're sort of like dumplings. Right. They're just going to kind of steam in the stew. 
and then um, you put them into the pot once it's boiling, and then you don't want to stir it because you don't want them to come apart. Hmm. And that's all there is to it. And you just let it let it there right, cook exactly. until... Right, exactly. Yep. Why? I tell you, that's a mixture of food. <laughs> uh, let's turn Charlie Keenan loose on this, uh, uh, ingredient by ingredient. Meatballs are good, <laughs> but but now Brussels sprouts are good. Mm -hmm. But here's my favorite right here. That is a rutabaga. <laughs> and I like the rutabaga. I think that gives this dish a nice tang. The rutabaga, you can actually, I, that maybe I ought to fish one out here and eat it by itself. <laughs> hmm? Can you taste it? You they're like potatoes. They're, oh, they're, a whole they're, lot. they're tangier than the potatoes, and they, they, they make this dish. <laughs> Not the crushed red peppers or the meatballs? Nuts. Yes, I nuts. think so, too. I, I think these little meatballs do it. This is like pimento. <laughs> it has nothing to do with this. He's been duped the all these parsley. years. <laughs> like the parsley or something, maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's why my mother kind of coerced me into eating my rutabagas. <laughs> there you go. I actually think they're good. <laughs> I don't know, but you know the, the venison flavor comes through in these yeah, meatballs. It sure does. It's good, like hamburger soup with uh, mm -hmm. with everything else in the mm -hmm. cupboard. In years past, in the guide report, I've indicated where beefsteak morels are popping up around the state. This is what beefsteak morels look like. They're sort of gnarly and brown. Now, a lot of people eat beefsteaks. They taste a lot like morels, but are beefsteak morels safe for everybody to eat? Mushroomer John Riley from Grocio wrote to me and said, there are as many opinions as there are morels in the woods. The true experts all say the same thing, though. Beef steaks are poisonous. There are well-documented records of fatalities from people eating beefsteak morels. Now, this is true. Most people can eat them. A few people can't have severe allergic reactions. That's good enough reason to take them off of the guide report. So we'll just talk about morels, of which there's no news right now. Uh, we've had this cold front that moved through the state. All in all, things should improve because the weather's got to improve. This weekend should be a great one. Get outdoors if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Is. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, let's go bass fishing. Some tips and ideas on catching smallmouth bass and a look at barbless hooks, pro and con. Do they lose more fish than barbed hooks? What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of going barbless? Let me just say that I've found in many cases barbless hooks are a definite practical advantage, but there are drawbacks. It's not that fish get off the hook, though. We'll explore that subject next week right here on Public TV. When they're down in the water, they look a lot bigger. <laughs> That's what the deal is.